This is the first of our two sessions on Trinitarian theology and Christology. And uh, to start with, I'll, I'll be speaking in the first half of this session on Christian understanding of the Trinity in the New Testament. And then Dr. Mary Cunningham, a uh, big welcome to her, uh, will be speaking about the, the, the sub-apostolic period, the, the, the apostolic fathers, and the first uh, reactions to the experience of Christ recorded in the New Testament. So the module as a whole deals with Trinitarian theology and Christology, with a particular focus on the early church, but not exclusively on the early church. And in this first weekend course, we're going to be looking especially at the theology of the Holy Trinity. And the next weekend course, in March, we'll be centering our attentions on the person of Christ, i.e. Christology. But clearly this kind of distinction between Trinitarian theology and Christology is somewhat artificial. It's impossible to speak of the Trinity without speaking of Christ, and impossible to speak of Christ without speaking of the Trinity. As St. Athanasius put it, and we're going to say a lot more about St. Athanasius from the 4th century, how is it possible for someone not to err, or be mistaken with regard to the incarnate presence of Christ, if he is ignorant of the genuine and true generation of the Son from the Father? So in other words, you can't be right or less wrong about Trinitarian theology if you're wrong or about Christology. The two are inseparable and to, to a certain extent we'll be shuttling between Christology and Trinitarian theology in the course of this module. But even more fundamentally we have to acknowledge that it's quite mistaken to approach questions of dogma, questions of doctrine, as if they were somehow divorced from the lived experience of the church as witnessed in scripture and in tradition. Um, we don't start by talking about a, an abstract substance, the usia, hypostases. We start with the, the Christ event as recorded in the New Testament. And the bottom line is that Christians knew Christ to be God long before they had any means of expressing how Christ could be God. And they worshipped Father, Son and Holy Spirit long before they had any Trinitarian theology. So the terms Trinitarian theology and Christology are convenient ones when we're speaking about Father, Son and Spirit, when we're speaking about the person of Christ, divine and human. But ultimately it comes down to this lived experience recorded in the New Testament and in the tradition of the Church. And indeed it would be quite absurd to expect to find any developed doctrine of the Trinity or doctrine of the person of Christ in the New Testament. That's not what the New Testament is about. The words of scripture are there not as a historical record or a collection of good advice, but as a witness to a lived experience of a person. And that's made very clear in the beginning of the first epistle of John. And I put some text on a handout for you, which I'll Just take one and pass it on. And this is the beginning of the first epistle of John, or John 1, 1 to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's perhaps the clearest statement that the Bible gives us as to the nature and purpose of Scripture. We're not dealing simply with knowledge of what Christ said or what Christ did, but with the extension to us of the Apostles' encounter with the living Christ. The Apostles weren't sent into the world because they, they knew a lot about Christ, but because they were with Christ, with this person. So when we're beginning our exploration of the response of the church to this lived encounter, it makes sense to begin with the apostles' own struggles to express this baffling and overwhelming experience of the crucified and risen Christ. And I'm using here um, the apostles' response to Christ as a way in to uh, discussing the teaching of the church on the Trinity, because it's through Christ that we come to the Trinity. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So when we're looking at the, the New Testament record, we're looking primarily at this experience of Christ 
and the apostles questioning as to who Christ is. And that kind of questioning as to who Christ is, is allowed for, uh, deliberately requested by the Lord himself. Matthew 16, always a good place to start when we're dealing with Christology or Trinitarian theology. Jesus' own question to his disciples. <coughs> this is number two on your handout. Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? We are invited to, to question the identity, the nature of Christ by Christ himself. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood, i.e. human reason, has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he strictly told them to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, this confession of Jesus as the Christ came to Peter, as the Gospel text tells us, not through rational debate, not through flesh and blood, but through the gift of God the Father. In other words, what comes first is faith, reasoning only afterwards. And as soon as we start speaking about Christology, we're making a statement of faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. But we shouldn't separate faith from understanding. As I say in this text, Christ himself invites the apostles to say what they think. <coughs> so faith naturally leads to the desire for understanding. If we believe Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God, there's no way we can stop ourselves from asking what that means. And to begin that process, um, I'll structure uh, this part of the session around some of the titles given to Christ in the New Testament, and they're listed at the top of your handout. And I'll begin with the, the title, Son of Man. In the text we looked at from Matthew, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. And that's by far the most common term Jesus uses of himself in the Gospels. He never refers to himself directly in so many words as the Christ or even the Son of God. And this term, Son of Man, uh, in the language which Jesus spoke, Aramaic, means simply man, bar nashar. Someone who is born of man is obviously man. The Son of Man title, therefore, serves the purpose of emphasising Jesus' humanity. Although, of course, at the time, I don't think it, it was his humanity that needed any underlining. That was perfectly obvious to the disciples that they were dealing with a human being, albeit something more than a simple human being. And in the Gospels, Jesus often uses this term, son of man, as a substitute for the first person. So instead of saying, I or me, that the terms I or me don't really have very much place in the Christian story. And this is the case in the passage from Matthew we're looking at. Who do men say that the Son of Man is? Followed up by, but who do you say that I am? So when Peter replies that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, he's saying something very particular. This Greek word, Christos, is the translation of the Hebrew word, Mashiach, meaning the anointed one. I've uh, given you both the Greek and uh, transliteration of the Hebrew there. In the Old Testament, this word Christ or Messiah is used to describe those who have been specially chosen and blessed by God to do his will upon earth. So we get someone like the Persian king Cyrus called the Anointed One, Christ, someone like David called the Lord's Anointed. What we don't have in the Old Testament is any sense that the Messiah is going to be some sort of future deliverer of Israel. This is something which emerges outside the pages of the Old Testament. But of course, by the first century AD, Palestine had long been under foreign domination, most recently under the domination of the Romans, who conquered the area in 63 BC. And many of the Jews longed for the restoration of the undivided kingdom of David, the kingdom, uh, the res restoration of which had been promised to them through the prophets. And because David had been the anointed one, of God, it was commonly assumed that the king whom God would raise up to restore David's kingdom would also be an anointed one of God, or a Christ, hence the term Messiah. 
and it was often assumed in this period that the one who would restore the undivided kingdom of David would be a descendant of David. And that brings us on to another title we have, the Christ, Son of David. Jesus, of course, is called Son of David by the blind beggar, Bartimaeus, in Mark 10, and also by the crowd as he entered Jerusalem. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the title Son of David is certainly closely related to the title Christ. And Jesus accepted the titles Christ and Son of David, but gave him a very different orientation. He very much confounded <coughs> some of the expectations that those who saluted him as he entered Jerusalem obviously had of what he would do for them. And straight after Peter's confession in Matthew 16, Jesus, in Matthew's words, began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And that's not at all what Peter had in mind when he called Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Get behind me, Satan, says Jesus. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but on the side of men. And Jesus goes on to speak of the way of the cross and the need to recognize the primacy of the spiritual over the material. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And here Jesus is clearly giving a quite um, wholly new interpretation to the concept of Messiah, uh, not a military figure leading the people out of bondage to the Romans, but associating the idea of the Messiah more closely with, for example, the suffering servant spoken of by Isaiah, Isaiah 53, the lamb led to the slaughter the transgression of the people. Quite a new version of the Messianic hope. Now, let's move on to another title, the title Son of God. The terms Messiah or Son of David clearly refer to God's instrument, one whom God would raise up to save Israel. And like the title Son of Man, Christ and Son of David put the emphasis on Jesus' humanity, even the Saviour of Israel, if that were to be the case, Jesus would still be God's instrument. We as yet have no sense of Jesus as in any way divine. And the divine character of Jesus is, of course, much more clearly summed up in this title, Son of God, which Peter does use of Christ in that passage in Matthew 16. But this title, Son of God, could mean many things. In the Old Testament, it's referred to angels or faithful kings. Now, the peacemakers are called sons of God in the Sermon of the Mount, the Beatitudes. But when applied to Jesus himself, it obviously takes on a special meaning. And the next incident we have after this passage recorded in Matthew 16 is the Transfiguration, uh, a very clear manifestation of Jesus' divinity, in which the voice of the Father affirms that this is my beloved Son. So it's clear from the Gospels that Jesus is the Son of God in a unique way. John, the Gospel of John, attaches a special significance to the title and goes on to give us some of the clearest indications we have in the Gospels of Christ's divinity. So he who has seen me has seen the Father. I am the Father, are one. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. But we also have this theme in the Synoptic Gospels. It would be a mistake to suppose these kind of affirmations only appear in John. In Matthew, Jesus says... Matthew 11, 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. There's clearly far more than had ever been said by any prophet, or indeed of the expected human Messiah. What did it all mean? And many of the early followers of Jesus soon came to the conclusion that it must mean that Jesus was, in some sense, God. Just as the Son of Man was man, so the Son of God had to be God. But this pattern of thought, I think, only becomes clearly established after the resurrection. And we can see it most clearly in these two further titles we find used, Lord and Word. This title, Lord, is particularly prominent in, the, in St. Paul. And remember that the letters of St. Paul are, in all probability, rather earlier than the texts of the Gospels, as we have them. Now we know from the book of Acts that Christians soon began confessing Jesus to be Lord. Um, we have this very early prayer, um, Maranatha, Lord come, or Lord come quickly, in 1 Corinthians 16. And of course this is a Trinitarian prayer, 
No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. And all this was a huge step to call Jesus Lord. Now the term Lord had been in, in use amongst um, uh, the Jews as a way of not saying the sacred name of God, the Tetragrammaton, um, in Hebrew Adonai. And the term Adonai in the Hebrew can be rendered into Greek as Kyrios, Lord. So to, for the early Christians to confess Jesus as Lord and to pray to him as Lord was to make the claim that he was to be ranked alongside the supreme God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. It's quite one thing to say Jesus was the Messiah. That could be accepted up to the point, um, a favoured minister of God. But quite another to say that he was Lord, in other words, in some sense, God. And it's difficult to exaggerate quite how shocking much of this must have sounded to many in first century Palestine. And it took an event of earth-shattering importance, i.e. the resurrection, to overcome what must have been a very deep-seated horror at the idea of applying this title, Lord, to anyone, uh, anyone but God himself. So it's perhaps the most significant title of these titles we're looking at that we've come across thus far. And St. Paul, when he um, underlines what he means by confessing Jesus to be Lord, is drawing attention, one of the ways he does this is to draw attention to the pre-existence of Jesus. And we see this in a passage from Philippians, which I've given you, uh, passage 3. Uh, and it may reflect an early Christian hymn. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and this um, uh, emphasis on the pre-existence of Christ is something which is picked up again in Colossians 1 15 to 20 and that's the last passage I've given you there he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And all this brings us to our next and last title, Word, or Logos in the Greek. And St. Paul's understanding is reproduced and amplified in all its essentials in the prologue to St. John's Gospel. I haven't given you that there because it's uh, so famous, I imagine you'd know it off by heart. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Uh, note the pre-existence, emphasis on creation. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the life of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And what did John mean when he called Christ the Word, or Logos? We have to remember that the title Lord, while certainly shocking to anyone brought up in the Jewish tradition, would have conveyed less meaning to uh, anyone from the wider Greco-Roman world. In the Greek world, the term Kyrios would be one of respect, certainly, but not one that would immediately make one think of God. I mean, even today the title Kyrios can be applied to any man in uh, modern Greece, um, more or less equivalent to Mr., perhaps somewhat more respectful, but essentially um, it's something you can certainly imply to people uh, of your own acquaintance. So not, uh, certainly not shocking to a, to a Greek ear, the word Kyria, Kyrios, Lord. But the reason behind St. John's use of this title, word, go deeper than that. Um, 
for by word, John, of course, and this is slightly picking up on some of the material we had last time with Father Nikolai, is meaning something which is quite beyond what can be conveyed by the English term word, or indeed the Hebrew term word, or tabar. In the Old Testament, the phrase word of God comes up a number of times, but uh, generally speaking, simply to refer to one of God's utterances. And similarly, in the New Testament, we do see the phrase word of God being used for the Christian message, the Christian gospel. But in the prologue to the Gospel of John, and only there, John is very clearly speaking of something very particular, a personal divine reality, not just of God's spoken or written word. And here he's drawing not so much upon the Jewish tradition as upon traditions of Greek philosophy. And we'll be seeing a great deal more in this course as to the ways in which philosophy was brought into the service of theology in the early church. This term, logos, thought, reason, principle, expressed something quite uh, profound for, for anyone trained in any way in the Greek philosophical tradition. It denoted the, the basic underlying rational principle of the universe. So to call someone who appeared as a human uh, upon earth the underlying principle of the universe would convey to the Greek ear something almost as profound as what this term the Lord would have conveyed to someone brought up within the Jewish tradition. So I think in the title word we have something of a uh, counterweight or complementary concept to this title Lord. So when John calls Christ the Logos, the Word, he's amplifying what St. Paul had said about Christ's work in creation before the Incarnation. But the same theology underpins Paul and John on this point. Uh, Paul often uses the term wisdom to speak of Christ's pre-existence. Uh, the figure of wisdom in the Old Testament is seen as being embodied in this person, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, by Paul. Paul calls Christ the wisdom and power of God in 1 Corinthians 24. Uh, but um, <coughs> whether you use the term word or wisdom, as I say, essentially the same theology is being conveyed uh, through both John and Paul here, speaking of a pre-existent divine person through whom the world was created and who has himself taken flesh to become incarnate to redeem the world. Now, all this very much just a kind of potted uh, some selected highlights from the New Testament on the person of Christ as a way into understanding um, the Holy Trinity. And as the early church struggled to understand its faith that Christ was somehow both God and man, it was led on directly to the question of how Christ related to the Father, to the one God of the Old Testament. How could you reconcile monotheism, the confession of one God, with the recognition of the divinity of Christ, that Christ was somehow divine? And how does the divinity of Christ square with the divinity of the Father? And how could you avoid ditheism if you recognised Christ to be in some sense divine? Did that mean you had two gods? And what about this mysterious paraclete, the comforter, the advocate, the Holy Spirit? And I've said relatively little about the Holy Spirit thus far because I wanted to put the focus on the person of Christ as the, the overwhelming event which led the Apostles to consider what we now call the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. How did the Holy Spirit relate to the Father and the Son? Did that mean we not only had two gods but three gods or one God in different forms or modes or guises or one God, the Father and two lesser gods? How are you going to explain all this to the pagan and Jewish worlds? How could you maintain a doctrine of the one God, but at the same time acknowledging that God, the Word, took flesh and dwelt among us? So, clearly there are a great many questions to answer, and uh, we'll be looking at the churches, <coughs> some of the church's answers to these questions in what follows this weekend. But I wanted to make the point, quite simply, that it's all there, in the New Testament. In short, Christians knew Christ as Lord and worshipped Father, Son and Holy Spirit long before they'd ever heard of Christology or Trinitarian theology. Now we have a little uh, break there. We have a couple of questions if there are any and then we'll hand over to, to Mary uh, to complete this session. Thank you. 
we don't have any questions now, we might have to take any questions or comments later and uh, go straight over to, 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 to Mary. a handout around which by some miracle seems very similar in its format to what Marcus did so I think we will complement each other quite well and Marcus has certainly given a very good foundation for what I wanted to talk about just moving on from the New Testament writings in the period just after most of those writings but not all had been completed, um, some writings that I'll be talking about, in fact, overlap with the New Testament, but we have the writings that are known as the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. In a sense, this is a generation later of people who are one step removed, perhaps, from the immediate experience of the people in the early church. The collection includes a number of writings, uh, including uh, works by authors such as uh, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch. These were early bishops in the church, writing sort of around the end of the first and beginning of the second centuries. Um, other writings in this collection include um, those by Hermas, Polycarp, the text known as the Didache, an early, probably very early, um, manual of church practice, uh, which it's not really known when that was written, but it may have been as early as the last decades of the first century. I recommend very highly this little collection, um, Early Christian Writings, a Penguin book which is translating many of these writings. Um, the translator is Maxwell Staniforth. And this new revised edition has good notes and commentary by Father Andrew Louth. And that's the uh, collection that I'll, of translations that I'll be using. One other thing I would say about the writings of the Apostolic Fathers is that these are, in a sense, occasional writings. They aren't systematic in their theology. They were often called forth or written in response to the needs of individual communities or directed to particular communities. Of course, the same could be said of the epistles of St. Paul, um, which are often responding to immediate problems in the early church. And in a sense, these writings do just carry on from that tradition. Many of them are in the form of letters. Some are more visionary or apocalyptic, but you see really almost a continuous tradition here with no real break. Now in these writings of the Apostolic Fathers, I would say that the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is not systematically addressed. Um, that will come later. But it seems to be accepted that all prayer that is directed to Christ with the Holy Spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit, will reach the Father. But Christ is usually the focal point, the point of contact with the Trinity in these writings. He is himself called God fairly frequently in many of these writings. And as Marcus was saying, I think there is an acceptance already, as there was in the writings of the New Testament, that Christ is God um, there's an understanding in the life of the church of uh, the existence of the Trinity in three persons and of the relationship between them. But Christ is also called by other names, many of the ones that Marcus was talking about, such as Lord, Son, Word of God, and so on. It's generally understood, but I would say it's more implicit than explicit in the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, that the Holy Spirit 
has existed in the Trinity from the beginning of time, uh, even perhaps co-eternally with Father and Son, and was always working from the very first moment of creation when the Holy Spirit moved upon the waters. He inspired the prophets, this is often mentioned in these writings, and was sent down upon the apostles at Pentecost, and is in the church um, inspiring prayer and making it possible for people to offer their worship to Christ and through Christ to the Father. But as I said, I think there's no systematic working out of these ideas. One gets the sense this is uh, a Trinitarian belief that is being lived in the experience of the church, being expressed by these fathers, but without attempting to put it into any systematic form. So what I was want, hoping to do tonight um, is focus in particular on one of the Apostolic Fathers, Ignatius of Antioch. Tomorrow morning, I will move somewhat later and take you through the second and early third centuries, but again, I'm going to focus on particular figures in this period. Tomorrow, I'll be looking at Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Lyon, and I'll finish with Origen. Obviously, I will be leaving a great deal out, but on thinking about how to present this topic, I decided it would probably be more useful if we looked in more detail at particular texts rather than trying to just give a very general overview. This whole period is known as the sub-apostolic period, which really is the official term for the period right up to the fourth century um, when Trinitarian debate um, began really to get going uh, in connection with Arius and the Council of Nicaea and so on. But we are entering a period, I think, where Christians who had known Christ or even his disciples had mostly died. This is a second generation, if you like, or even a third. It is made up of apostles, bishops, and teachers who continue to spread the good news about Christ and to convert pagans and Jews to Christianity. And of course, there's the growing number of communities and laity who are becoming Christians in this period. So what are the sources of revelation for the Christian bishops and teachers in this period? Above all, it is scripture. And in this early period, I would say right through till about the middle of the second century, scripture is the Old Testament, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. The New Testament writings were circulating um, in the earlier period. Some of them might have been confined to certain areas or communities before they circulated more widely. But uh, they were not considered scripture in the same way that the Old Testament was. John Baer's book, uh, The Way to Nicaea, which I recommend very highly as background to this period. He has a very interesting and very unified approach to all of these texts. He suggests that when early Christians read scripture, they had a particular way of reading it. They had a hypothesis, as he calls it. The key or the hypothesis to understanding scripture, and this as I've just said, is the Old Testament primarily, is to see that this is the story of Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of scripture, the figure who wraps up its meaning, who gives meaning to the Old Testament. Everything is pointing towards him, prophecy, typology, the whole historical progression of events and God's involvement in creation is leading up to Christ's incarnation his passion on the cross and resurrection. And that is how people would have read the Old Testament. And it's how they encountered Christ through scripture. 
Of course, they also had an encounter with Christ through the church. And in some writings, and I would say this is particularly true of Ignatius, this is the primary experience that he seems to express. He knows Christ through his faith, through his participation in the sacraments, and this is a direct experience, an encounter with Christ. But perhaps to understand that at a deeper level, people would meditate and pray and interpret scripture as the key to understanding who this Christ, this God-man is. Now, one other aspect of the second century, which I think I should mention, and which is very much stressed by many, many scholars these days, is its diversity. There were diverse communities of people all living together in the later Roman Empire around the Mediterranean, of many religious backgrounds, um, ethnic groups and languages, of course, as well. But what many scholars have been stressing greatly, especially since the discovery of the Nakh Hammadi collection of texts in Egypt, this was a cache of manuscripts discovered in 1945, which contains texts which are usually described as Gnostic. We've suddenly gained this awareness of a Christianity which was characterized by many different groups living together, some of whom held very diverse beliefs. Orthodox Christian writers were very aware of this Gnostic challenge, and this comes through in their own writings in the course of the second century. Some of these writings of the Apostolic Fathers and the Post-Apostolic Fathers are quite polemical, and they are answering the kind of challenges that Gnostic teaching was posing to the church. I don't have time to go into this tonight, um, but I think just to mention a few of these main challenges, one teacher who was uh, teaching and in fact established a separate church, which he called a Christian church in Rome um, in the 140s AD, was Marcion who had the idea that there is a new God of the New Testament and that the Old Testament should be entirely rejected and that there is no connection between the two. Some of the writings of the later fathers have to address this problem and to show that there is unity between the Testaments. There is one scripture, there is one God, and that Christ is prophesied in the Old Testament. Other Gnostic groups seem to have had various views of Trinity. Some had very elaborate whole um, ideas of many eons, as they called them, of emanations from God the Father who surrounded him in some sort of fullness, as they called it. But some groups even describe some kind of Trinitarian view with first, second, and third persons one of whom is female, and so on. These were uh, beliefs and groups of people of whom the mainstream church was aware. And I think we have to keep it in mind that Trinitarian doctrine had to be defined against this background to some extent. Scholars differ very much on uh, how they view this diversity of the second century. Some, uh, these are especially people who are specialists in the field of Gnosticism, often argue that this was a creative, innovative um, period in which people were searching and exploring many different beliefs, and that the mainstream church then clamped down on these groups and suppressed them and uh, they stress a very sort of hierarchical, oppressive uh, male hierarchy of the church, eliminating these um, interesting and creative groups of people who called themselves Christians. 
Others, uh, other scholars, and this is a more traditional view, which was endorsed especially by Harnack in the 19th century, see the church moving away from its apostolic origins and establishing doctrines which he believed were much elaborated, were departing from the simple origins, the pure origins of the apostolic view of the Trinity. What I would suggest uh, in answer to this question, and I think if one studies the texts of the Apostolic Fathers carefully, one finds as early as the late first century, but possibly even much earlier, as Marcus was suggesting, already a very strong and clearly believed, if not always expressed, understanding of Trinitarian doctrine. I don't think this is something that sort of developed or moved away from the core that we can see in the New Testament and in the earliest writings of the Apostolic Fathers. There is also a very clear sense in many of these um, sub-apostolic writers of what orthodoxy is, of what the core of Christian faith is, a rejection of what seems to be clearly Gnostic at times, and you have to remember there were many other Gospels, many other texts circulating, um, which do show particular deviations, I think, from the kinds of revelation that we find expressed in what have been accepted either as canonical or as apostolic writings. So that's the question of diversity, which I would ask you to keep in mind. But I must move quickly on now to look at Ignatius of Antioch, who, uh, of course, lived fairly early, um, <clears throat> late first, early second centuries, and <clears throat> who expresses in his letters some very interesting, clearly very orthodox ideas about the Trinity. I'd just like to remind you that St. Ignatius was a bishop of Antioch. Um, he is thought to have been the third bishop after St. Peter. During the reign of Trajan, who reigned between 98 and 117 AD, Ignatius was arrested, condemned as a Christian, and sent to Rome to be martyred in the arena. And in the course of this journey, which was mainly overland across Asia Minor and um, Greece, he took the opportunity to write letters to the Christian communities that he passed through. And these letters survive. They express not only Ignatius' ideas about his own approaching martyrdom, and in fact he mentions that very little, although sometimes he alludes to it and speaks of the great honor of living out his discipleship of Christ in this way. But he also expresses very deep, very significant ideas in the areas of ecclesiology and also Trinitarian thought. The letters, of course, are following very much a well-known literary genre, and he was probably very conscious that he was imitating St. Paul, if you like, in writing to these communities they have an almost homiletic feeling about them, a paranetic function, which is to encourage and teach the various Christian communities to which they are addressed. And thus these letters often do address particular figures, bishops in these communities, and the problems that they were experiencing in their ministry. But what I want to look at in particular in what remains of this lecture are St. Ignatius's statements, what he says about the Trinity and his belief in Christ. I'd like to show, as I believe, that what he expresses here is very distinctive in its way. Um, he is expressing a very personal understanding, but also very significant and also, I would say, unified orthodox view. 
there's a great deal of uh, very well-developed thought in these letters. Throughout the seven letters, he repeatedly emphasizes the key elements of the Christian faith. And I think this reflects his desire that the communities should remain steadfast in faith. They should follow their bishops, who will in turn impart the correct understanding of the faith to their flocks. This, again, if you set it against the background of the diversity that was uh, that existed in this period, the threat from groups with very um, heterodox beliefs, um, this was an important injunction for Ignatius to be sending out. He does seem to have a somewhat hierarchical understanding of how knowledge or revelation, which is the life in Christ, proceeds downward from Father to Christ, the Son, to the bishops of the church, and through the bishops to the people. For example, if you look at your uh, A on your handouts, he writes, For we can have no life apart from Jesus Christ. And as he represents the mind of the Father, so our bishops, even those who are stationed in the remotest parts of the world, represent the mind of Jesus Christ. This, there's this need for the hierarchy of the church to mediate revelation, to interpret correctly scripture and convey it to the people. This passage is followed by a very memorable one in which the image of a harp is used to describe the harmonious order of the church body when it is working well and in accordance with this hierarchy. In your example B, he writes, your justly respected clergy who are a credit to God are attuned to their bishop like the strings of a harp, and the result is a hymn of praise from minds that are in unison and affections that are in harmony. Pray then, come and join this choir, every one of you. Let there be a whole symphony of minds in concert. Take the tone all together from God and sing aloud to the Father with one voice through Jesus Christ, so that he may hear you and know by your good works that you are indeed members of his Son's body. A completely united front will help to keep you in constant communion with God. This passage may seem to have more to do with ecclesiology than the Trinity, but of course everything is connected. And I've quoted it partly because I think it also illustrates one characteristic of Ignatius's thought, which deserves special emphasis. This is the fact that it is the risen Christ who is above all the source of revelation in the church. I would say that Ignatius stresses less than perhaps some of his successors, some of the people we'll be looking at tomorrow do, the idea of Christ the Word as he is encountered in Scripture. Father John Bear notes this in his book as well. He writes, Ignatius is focused upon the revealer and the revelation, not the instruments that is, the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, and so on, by which that revelation has been mediated to him. Ignatius seems to have a direct experience of Christ, and that is usually how he expresses it in these letters. And throughout the letters, he also teaches the recipients of his letters who, as he sees it, this Christ is we find succinct summaries of doctrine in passages such as the one that I've uh, numbered C on your handouts. This is also from the letter to the Ephesians. He writes, and this is almost a poetic, almost hymnic section of the letter, very flesh yet spirit to uncreated and yet born, God and man in one agreed, very life in death indeed fruit of God and Mary's seed, at once impassable and torn by pain and suffering here below, Jesus Christ, whom as our Lord we know. The translator here is even put in rhyme to convey the sort of poetic nature of this text. It's characteristic of the way Ignatius writes, 
he has a very sort of rhythmic rhyming quality to his whole prose style. It's a particular style known as the Asianic style, which characterizes many Hebrew writings, in fact. It seems to have been associated um, with mainly um, Asiatic writers, that is, people in the Near East, writing either in Greek or Hebrew. Um, that term, in fact, was given to this rhetorical style by Edward Norden. But it comes out especially in this prayer, in this statement about the nature of Christ. You'll note also there the strong use of antithesis, stressing both the humanity and the divinity in each line, the impassibility, but the death, the suffering on the cross, and so on. Fruit of God and Mary's seed. Very strong Christological statement here about two natures of Christ. But above all, I think what we notice in Ignatius's statements about Christ throughout the letters is the emphasis on his continuing presence among Christians and the reality of his human incarnation, passion and resurrection. Another example which I've given you in D in the letter to the Tralians, he writes, close your ears then if anyone preaches to you without speaking of Jesus Christ. Christ was of David's line. He was the son of Mary. He was verily and indeed born and ate and drank. He was truly persecuted in the days of Pontius Pilate and truly and indeed crucified and gave up the ghost in the sight of all heaven and earth and the powers of the netherworld. He was also verily raised up from the dead, for his father raised him. And in Jesus Christ will his father similarly raise us who believe in him, since apart from him there is no true life for us. What I'd like to emphasize there is the stress on the reality of Christ's life, death, resurrection. Here I think Ignatius is conscious of the threat of docketism, Oh, sure, sorry, yes. just illustrating from Ignatius's letters his understanding of Christ and of the Trinity and I will just carry on and finish that and then we'll open it up for questions in some of these sections in as ex for example in the letter to the Tralians which is D on your handouts Ignatius emphasizes very much the true human incarnation of Christ, his real passion on the cross, and the resurrection. Now I think here, 
he has in mind probably, although he is stating this reality as he knows it, as he has encountered it in the church, but he is aware of groups that were preaching a docetic view of Christ. This was the belief that Christ only appeared to be a man, that he remained God, was walking around on earth, but was in fact really God and not uh, condescending to take the um, humble form of a human being. Various Gnostic groups we know taught this belief. Marcion himself taught this. Um, and Ignatius perhaps was stressing it, especially here, that Christ was truly human and divine. But of course, it's also coming straight out of his understanding of scripture, of prophecy, and of the New Testament writings, and of his experience of life in Christ in the church. To give you another example in your handout, this is E, he writes, for my own part, I know and believe that he was in actual human flesh, even after his resurrection. When he appeared to Peter and his companions, he said to them, take hold of me, touch me, and see that I am no bodiless phantom. And they touched him then and there and believed, for they had had contact with the flesh and blood reality of him. That was how they came by their contempt of death and proved themselves superior to it. Moreover, he ate and drank with them after he was risen, like any natural man, though even then he and the Father were spiritually one. That's from the letter to the Smyrnaeans. So this is a very historically grounded, but also very theological explanation of who Jesus Christ is. Ignatius is, of course, removed from that immediate experience that the apostles had, but he has read scripture, he has perhaps known people who knew them, he is expressing this reality as he knew it. So far I've only discussed Ignatius's teachings on Jesus Christ, and as Marcus was saying, Christ is the focus of many Trinitarian writings in this period. He is the way to the Trinity, if you like. But can we say anything of Ignatius's view of the other two members of the Trinity? It has been noticed that Ignatius does not refer often to the Father. And when he does, he, as we saw earlier, I think, he expresses the view, as the New, uh, many New Testament writings did as well, that the way to the Father is through Christ. But he also has some unusual ideas, um, which I think I would just like to suggest uh, perhaps reflect something of his understanding to, to the extent that he could have an understanding of the Father. As I've said, in a wholly orthodox way, Ignatius believes that the Father is only known through Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. But when he does refer to the Father, he calls him the author of all things, the head of Christ, as the bishop is to his people. He is to be praised through Christ, as Ignatius suggests in the lines, sing aloud to the Father with one voice through Christ. That's in the letter to the Ephesians. In another section or another passage of the same letter, Ignatius expresses the idea that Christ not only spoke but was also silent, and that truth may emerge through silence as much as through words. And this very striking idea we find in, uh, I've given you in the handout under F. He writes, Indeed, it is better to keep quiet and be than to make fluent professions and not be. No doubt it is a fine thing to instruct others, but only if the speaker practices what he preaches. One such teacher there is, he who spake the word and it was done, and what he achieved even by his silences was well worthy of the Father. Here he is referring to Christ. 
A man who has truly mastered the utterances of Jesus will also be able to apprehend his silence and thus reach full spiritual maturity so that his own words have the force of actions and his silence is the significance of speech. It seems possible to me that what Ignatius is saying about Christ here reflects an understanding of the Father. The Father is silence, which comes in rational and verbal expression through the word. But silence also is an expression of truth, a greater expression perhaps, and can to an extent be apprehended and even imitated by human beings. But he does say that both silence and words are conveyed to us from the Father by the Son. As for the Holy Spirit, we only gain an occasional glimpse of his role in these very Christ-centered writings of St. Ignatius. But he is there, I think he's implicitly there, and his presence and cooperation with the Word in all that he does is something, a theme throughout the letters. I'd like to just finish with one memorable metaphor which Ignatius employs in his attempt to express uh, his Trinitarian thought. And this is an image of a building which I think symbolizes the church being erected with the help of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He writes, Deaf as stones you were, yes, stones for the Father's temple, stones trimmed ready for God to build with, stones trimmed ready, sorry, I repeated a line there, hoisted up by the derrick of Jesus Christ, the cross, with the Holy Spirit for a cable, your faith being the winch that draws you up to God, up the ramp of love. This is a vivid image of the cooperation of not only the Trinity, but the people with the help of the Trinity in creating this temple of God, the Church. To conclude, and I've run over time, I'm sorry, I think I would conclude this lecture that by, just by reiterating that for the apostolic writers, Christ is clearly the source of revelation. But of course we are aware, although it's not always stated explicitly, that we are given the power to understand, we are able to approach this revelation by the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is conferred, of course, on all Christians through baptism. Again, I think I would just say that Ignatius expresses an encounter and experience of Christ which he gains through the church. He stresses his uh, experience of Christ through scripture to a lesser extent, I would say, than simply the sense of Christ being present in our midst. As we'll see tomorrow, um, the Trinitarian thought which is so present in the New Testament and in these early writings continues to be reflected on in the course of the second century and to be expressed in different ways. So I'd like to move on tomorrow to look at what is distinctive about some of the second century writers, ways of understanding and expressing their revelation of Trinity, but also to stress again how unified, in fact, this vision seems to be amongst all these writers. So whereas you can say that there appears to be great diversity in this period, with many Gnostic groups around the fringes of mainstream Christianity, we see a remarkably unified, uh, Trinitarian-centered, and guided by scripture, core community of Orthodox Christians in this period. Thank you.
So, if there are any questions on the biblical, the New Testament background, uh, on the immediate sub apostolic period, or, or comments, uh, I'm sure you speculation of that nature going on in this period. Um, perhaps by the end of the second, early third century, um, there is, begins to be more reflection on exactly what this means. But I would think at this stage it's more of a title and an understanding um, that he is the only begotten Son of God. Do you agree with that? Uh, but of course, you're right to point out that this was precisely one of the key phrases in the fourth century of the New Prophecy. Clearly, firstborn of all creation must mean that he's a creature, just as Proverbs 8 French 2 says, The Lord created me. It must mean that the word is a creature. But um, we've not yet got to that stage of the debate. But it's a reminder that none of these um, uh, biblical passages can be taken separately. What, what the great contribution of Athanasius was, for example, to read scripture as a whole. There's no point simply throwing bits of scripture at one another. Um, I am the Father or one, the Father is greater than I. If you just throw those at one another, you don't really get anywhere. So, so again and again, we're confronted with the, this basic theme that you've got to read scripture as a whole and within the tradition of the church. Otherwise, it makes no sense at all. And the sense of scripture is Christ. And this is why we started with Church. 
Um, so we have very little information about the extent to which they were within Christian communities or outside on the fringes. Um, but what we do know is that Christian teachers, such as, for example, Origen, were very aware of them and were preaching against them. Justin Martyr was another one. Um, in the same cities, there were rival teachers with rival teachings, and it was very important to make it clear what the orthodox teaching was in relation to these other groups. If you study these not Kamadi scriptures, you can see that some of the texts, for example, the Gospel of Thomas, are very close to our canonical texts of the New Testament. This is a collection of sayings of Christ. But if you read it carefully, you just see this subtle difference in the perception of who Christ is coming through this text. In the Gospel of Thomas, he's portrayed primarily as a teacher who is imparting secret teaching, secret knowledge to his disciples. And many of the other Gnostic texts suggest that as well. And it's just a striking contrast to what we see in Ignatius and in these other apostolic writings of the sense of Christ as God and as someone who transforms all people through his very being and through being among them. It's a, just a very different perception of who he is. But the, the division is very subtle, and scholars are still arguing about where the lines should be drawn, really. Yes, no. difficult passage, really. <laughs> um, it does suggest a very exalted role for the bishop, doesn't it? Um, if one just... Yes. <laughs> and I think I would say that Ignatius has a very exalted idea of the bishop. He places his trust and his confidence in bishops to hold these diverse and scattered communities together. And I think he's stressing here the authority that the bishop must have. Perhaps you should see it in relative terms that he's making this comparison between the bishop and his flock and the father and the son, rather than saying he's saying these two things are the same. It's just the relationship that he's looking at. That's how I would interpret it. But do you have a different idea or... <laughs> 
from one last one, perhaps? Come on, Claudio. <laughs> Jewish mentality, I mean, that's a, that's a more difficult question, of course, than the, the, the Christian interpretation of that text, which we see it as obviously pointing towards Christ. But within the Jewish uh, mentality, identifying the Son of Man with the Ancient of Days, I'm not sure, this, from a specifically Jewish perspective, quite what that would mean. In the, in the Jewish uh, traditional interpretation of uh, the figure of Daniel. Um, I mean, that, that is one text where, where you do have at least some hints of the idea of the Son of Man as having some sort of messianic status, but it's no more than the hint. And, and it's, you don't find that, that in any more than a shadowy fashion uh, in the Old Testament material. So I was trying to point out the whole notion of the Messiah is essentially an intertestamental notion side pages of the Old Testament, at least in the, in the Hebrew version thereof. But um, I do I can say on that one. Do you have any ideas? Or something? sympathetic interpretation of what Judas was up to, you know, not entirely out of kilter with that presented in the so-called gospel of, of Judas. That this was, uh, yes, um, what I would say, that that's a fairly um, speculative uh, interpretation of what's, what's going on, and uh, certainly that would be outside the mainstream Jewish tradition of exegesis, but, uh, but I think that brings us uh, more or less to the end of, of this session, but um, I I, it's not a stupid question, it's, it's, it's worth exploring these, 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 these issues. So, um, well, we've reached the end of the session, um, and now we'll um, move on to a, a slightly more social program. Uh, we'll, we'll, um, I don't think you've had anything to eat, or, 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 but we do have some food upstairs, and I believe some wine. It would be far inferior to the good wine you're used to in France, I'm sure, <laughs> but, but I hope you'll accept our humble offerings. On the, so everyone's invited to go upstairs and, and socialise a bit and meet our, meet our uh, cherished visitors from, from France, from Saint-Serge. And let's just um, well, I remind you of the programme tomorrow, 7.30am, Divine Liturgy, followed by breakfast, followed by 9.30, uh, the first lecture. And we'll be moving right up to the Council of um, Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople, Constantinople by lunchtime. And after lunch, Father Nicholas will be speaking to us about Christology and iconography. And then after that, we'll be moving on to Constantinople. So I think that's about all in terms of announcements and formal business. So I invite you to go upstairs and, and to give another uh, round of applause to, to Mary. Come up.